Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad everybody's here. Uh, you show us a great honor when you come and, and give us one of your Friday evenings. Uh, it's, uh, so I, I feel exceptionally privileged to be, to be here with you guys. It's a, it's a joy and a pleasure uh, to prepare uh, my talks for you. I know you enjoy them. You're very, very supportive. Uh, amazing, amazing audience. A lot of familiar faces as well. So thank you, and I hope you really enjoy what I've got in mind today. Let's get started. Uh, I need to introduce myself. Some people may not know, or you may not know how to pronounce my name. It's Klumpa. Uh, it looks like Klump, but that's cool. I've been renamed for many decades. Uh, and eventually, have a seat. Come on in. You're not late. You haven't missed anything interesting yet. And, uh, but uh, Dr. Klumpa, I've been a professor here for uh, 19 years, I think. Started in 1999, so that would mean fall of 2019 would be 20 years. Um, that's kind of nice. I've had a lot of interesting jobs. I began as a uh, first job I ever had was I was cleaning up towels in a locker room. That didn't last too long, but it paid a few bills. Uh, eventually, uh, started working for a geophysics company, maintaining uh, and servicing accelerometers because California's got lots of uh, earthquakes. And I eventually landed at JPL. Uh, spacecraft design, did that for a very long time. Been here for 19 years, JPL gig lasted 12, but uh, this was the job I was meant to have, I can tell you right now. I had a lot of fun, a lot of great memories, but there's nothing, nothing excites me more than to, uh, to be in the classroom uh, talking about science and having folks over. Uh, I have absolutely no regrets uh, whatsoever about the time I spent here at MTSU. And I'm really, really hoping that I can keep going until uh, the students, I guess, beg me to stop teaching because it's <laughs> starting to get kind of lousy. Actually, that's already happened. <laughs> oh, well. Who cares what students think? All right. <laughs> but let's get started. I gave a talk. There was a, uh, there was a student who was required to uh, watch uh, a professor teaching, and he had heard some good things about me, so he asked for permission to watch my class. He wanted to see my teaching methods. And at the end, he came up to congratulate me, and he, the thing he liked most was this. <laughs> he said, that is so cool. I go, this used to be all we had. <laughs> but the laser does not work on screens. So, so I have both now. I feel like I should have like a holster. Okay. Well, here we go. Talking about life on Mars, but uh, first I wanted to give a short tribute to Stephen Hawking. I hope you guys will bear with me on this. Uh, he was quite a man. He was very good at what he did. People loved him, and, uh, and for good reason. Um, his passing is kind of sad. Uh, he did pass on Pi Day, 3.141529.26, and my daughter can fill in the next 200 digits, probably. She memorized pi to 225 digits in like a couple of days. Freaked me out. And uh, I thought she was going to bust a gasket. And, uh, but there was that, you had, to be, you had to beat that freshman or something that she thought was going to be really good. Anyway, but uh, here he is. Uh, Stephen Hawking, um, I'll get to it. Some, the, the thing that really, he did something that really excited me. And uh, anyway, but he was the director of research at the Center for Theoretical Cosmology at the University of Cambridge. I think most of us knew that. And these are highlights. Uh, let's see, his collaboration with Roger Penrose on gravitational singularity theorems. This is what kind of led to the book he wrote called The Brief History of Time. I don't know if you know that. See, what this paper did, I don't know if you, do you guys know Roger Penrose? Is that a name you're familiar with? He's another kind of mathematician guy. But uh, it was this paper that led to an interview that he gave where he, he, he basically publicly admitted, we have just proven that time has a beginning. Uh, this whole idea on space-time theorems, uh, he was one of the first, and uh, he and Roger Penrose established that if general relativity is an accurate description of how the universe works, and under extremely general uh, conditions, then you will always have a time-past singularity in your cosmology, which is to say you will have a point in time uh, where time began and space began. And, uh, <clears throat> and so there you go. That's, uh, um, under general conditions that are to be expected. And that was very breathtaking and, and exciting for a lot of people because it really brought to mind this idea. We thought the universe has been forever or time goes on forever. And he was one of the first to show that time had a point of origin. 
His theoretical prediction that black holes emit radiation, if you take astrophysics from me, you will get to use these equations until you're sick of them. Uh, we study black holes and the thermodynamics of black holes. Uh, uh, anyway, but uh, called Hawking radiation, we all know about this. Of course, you understand this is a phenomenon that takes place outside the event horizon. So when you're answering questions of students, you have to make sure that's very clear. But uh, uh, that was an amazing uh, prediction on his part, yet to be detected. But we can hold on to hope. Uh, how long did it take Einstein's prediction for gravitational waves to be uh, detected? A hundred years. A hundred years, something, you know. Anyway, he was a pioneer in the effort to merge the theories of relativity and quantum mechanics and apply them to cosmology. Uh, he was a fellow of the Royal Society. He received the Presidential uh, Medal of Freedom. That's a, a very significant award in this country. Lucasian Professor of Mathematics. What other famous professor hold this, held the same professorial chair? <coughs> Pardon me? Isaac Newton, yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he never, ever spoke ill of Isaac Newton. He always spoke of him in the most glowing terms. I thought that was kind of cool of him. Very, very cool. And, uh, and uh, his book, and this is a book that I found absolutely amazing. I read the bulk of it while I was on a ski trip. Um, I used to sponsor ski trips, take college students out into the mountains, uh, cross-country skiing. And uh, this book uh, was part of what I took with me that week. And I was probably reading it before, and I couldn't put it down, so I dragged it along with me. But uh, a brief history of time. Uh, we would have been married for two years, huh? Remember? So you maybe remember me having that book. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, this blows me away how a book about science can be on a best-selling list <coughs> for more than an hour. Right? <laughs> that is, doesn't even make sense. Anyway, so. Those are amazing accomplishments, but I wanted to make sure that, um, that uh, we don't quickly forget his passing. All right, anyway, life on Mars. Let's get to the subject at hand. Uh, two types, uh, two types, microscopic and macroscopic. Microscopic would be like single cells, macroscopic would be like people, okay? Uh, here we go, I don't know why that's there twice. Oh, macroscopic, there you go. Okay, Stephen Hawking. Over the past century or so, humanity has accomplished, these are some of his more recent uh, proclamations uh, that he has made in like the last few years or so, but uh, this is leading up to a quote, but over the past century or so, humanity has accomplished a great deal of innovation. We learned to fly into space, cure diseases, develop computers, the internet, smart devices, but the past century has also presented humankind with a variety of challenges. You know, high-tech societies produce high-tech garbage, and things like that. Among other things, we can fight wars efficiently, so that's, gets, that's kind of a weird thing that pops up as well. So Hawking was, found, was fond of pointing out that humankind's days on Earth are numbered because of climate change, asteroid strikes, epidemics, and overpopulation. He believed we have 100 years left before doomsday, and the only way to survive would be get, to get off Earth long before that comes to pass. So he became a proponent of, uh, I guess, propelling uh, whatever technology innovation is required to get us moving and become a multi-planet species. That was sort of how he would look at it. Quote, I believe the long-term future of the human race must be in space. It will be difficult enough to avoid disaster on planet Earth in the next hundred years, let alone the next thousand or million. The human race shouldn't have all its eggs in one basket or on one planet. Let's hope we can avoid dropping the basket until we have spread the load. And this is something he was passionate about. And if you know anything about Stephen Hawking, he was a passionate man, okay? Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX CEO. It's okay to have your eggs in one basket, as long as you control what happens to that basket. What kind of a personality type are we describing right now? <laughs> yeah, this guy is driven. And he is, in some ways, single-minded. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, in September of 2016, uh, there's a journal called New Space. He put this, he, uh, he took his Mars colonization plan to paper. It finally made it into print. He talked about it for a while. It made it into print when it appeared in New Space. It was called Making Humanity a Multiplanetary Species. A brief list of his accomplishments towards this goal are, and I'm not going to re read them all. There's too many. Uh, but I'll read a few, and then I'll just flash them. And when I get to the last one, I'll read that one. Uh, and and involve, that one involved an actual Tesla flying through space. But this idea, you know, you talk about putting your money where your mouth is, you know, backing up your words with actions. I kind of feel like he's doing that, okay? 
Welcome. Make yourself comfortable. Glad you're here. OK. The, per the first privately funded liquid fuel rocket to reach orbit, 2008. The first privately funded company to, su to successfully launch orbit and recover a spacecraft, 2010. <coughs> The first private company to send a spacecraft to the International Space Station. On and on, 2013, Geosync uh, stage lands back on land, 2015. That's the Falcon 9 right there. Um, let's see, ocean platform landing, relaunch and landing of a used rocket. <clears throat> the first controlled flyback and recovery, commercial cargo, making money while you're doing it. First privately funded payload to escape Earth's gravity. Two of the three boosters of the same launch were successfully recovered. And we all witnessed, I think most of us actually witnessed this. Didn't we all like stop our classes so we could all have the students watch this? So there you go. So he's well on his way. He's well on his way. And uh, so that's macroscopic. We'll say more about it. What about microscopic life on Mars? <clears throat> OK. Well, it gets complicated. Hang with me. <clears throat> Your options are, it formed there, OK? I'm, I'm giving you options. I'm not telling you what actually has happened yet, OK? I'm giving you options. And this is a, uh, uh, that's a, uh, a, primordial, a primordial soup simulation. That's the famous Miller experiment uh, that we've heard about uh, for a very long time. So maybe it formed there. Or if it wasn't formed there, maybe it was carried there. But how could it have been carried there? Well, maybe naturally, OK? There is. Uh, I'm going to get to some of the statistics and the information, but um, you know, there's a lot of Earth rock that has made it to Mars simply because of uh, asteroid collisions and solar wind and those sorts of things. So if it was carried there, it could be there naturally or it could be there artificially. And artificially means it was done by something like a, uh, with uh, humans involved, it was carried. And when you do it artificially, it can be unintentional. We're going to talk. We're going to talk about the Phoenix mission and, and some of the things that have happened with that. And it can also be intentional. And then that's, uh, um, uh, that's um, Prometheus. Remember that story? And we're going to pick up on uh, another one of Ridley Scott's films tonight. <coughs> OK, so natural panspermia to Mars. OK, uh, there's a pretty picture there. Because life has been so abundant for so long on Earth, about 3.8 billion years, meteorites, comets, Asteroids striking Earth have exported Earth soil throughout interplanetary space. Astronomers have calculated that 200 kilograms of Earth soil, on average, resides on every square kilometer of the moon's surface. And for, for Martian surface, it's down by a factor of 10. Or, no, excuse me, a factor of uh, 2 to the, the 4. So it's 200 grams of Earth soil per square kilometer. And you take into account how many microorganisms uh, on the surface of Earth Astronomers have pretty much been leading the charge and saying, uh, we already know that Earth, we suspect that Earth life is already on Mars uh, for that reason. So, so since every ton of Earth soil contains about 100 quadrillion microbes, astrobiologists, if they make a diligent search, should find evidence for the remains of life on the moon, Mars, and nearly every other solar system body. And this is an article that popped up. Uh, the author was describing how uh, maybe microbes came to Earth from Venus. You notice that the, the, the prevalent path is moving away from the sun, because the solar wind is a very efficient way of propelling very small things. The cross-sectional area relative to their mass is, is, is large. <clears throat> what about unintentional uh, artificial panspermia? Unintentional. Well, new bacterial life. This was in, uh, when did this article come out? In 2013. New bacterial life form discovered in NASA and ESA spacecraft clean rooms. Now, I've worked in clean rooms. I've worked on spacecraft. Uh, the very first spacecraft to do life experiment on Mars, that was a part of that project. That was the Viking project. Um, you have to sterilize everything before you launch. Well, they sterilize their clean room. They sterilize the spacecraft. OK? That's a picture of the bacteria they found in the clean room. The researchers named the bacterium Tersococcus phoenicius. Tersa is Latin for clean, as in clean room. Coccus comes from the Greek and describes the bacterium in this genus berry-like shape. And Phoenicius, as the species name, pays homage to the phoenix lander. Yes, the cleanest clean rooms on the planet have virulent bacteria. <laughs> and it's on the spacecraft for sure. And it's on Mars. 
Okay? So now again, it's not because anyone's gone there and tested these things, but this is sort of the thing we're discovering. So maybe there has been uh, artificial, unintentional uh, panspermia with Mars. Okay, macro meets micro. What could possibly go wrong? Well, I'm going to show you five examples of where something could go wrong, where nobody expected anything could possibly go wrong. Here's our first one. Okay, Scottish Highland Games. You got whiskey tasting next to the axe throwing. Okay, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I don't know, man. I'll leave it up to you guys to decide, all right? My second example. This guy's grinding uh, some, some metal, and you've got these acetylene tanks over here. So what could possibly go wrong here? I don't know. OK, I can see no way in which this carefully laid plan could ever fail. This cat is walking on the top edge of a door. And it looks like, I don't know what it's going to try to do, but the balloon will not support its weight. <laughs> OK. Uh, super magnets next to the super knives. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting ready to plug in the super magnet. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I don't even know. But uh, I can venture a guess. I, could I guess the magnet's going like, to fly over and hit the guy with the knives or something, something like that. OK? All right. <laughs> the nuclear power plant next to a spider. <laughs> Who does this? Don't we all? I mean, we're going to have humongous. We're going to have, wait, wait, what's that species? Acromantulus. Yeah, they're going to start to show up. Aragog's descendants or something. Cousins. OK, yeah. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong? And I guess this is meant to help us realize that there's probably, if you're going to start sending people to Mars, do we really know what could possibly go wrong? That's sort of the point of my talk, in all honesty. Examples, uh, the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I just singled them out because they had a lot of information on the internet, and they, it was very interesting, and uh, I could understand their articles. That also is very useful if I can understand it, because uh, then I. But they, they talk about zebra mussels in the Great Lakes. Uh, this is a species that uh, just sort of took over. Uh, but they believe it was carried there by ballast water in ships. You know, ships will take on water if they need to. And if you empty that water, you, you take up that water in one lake or one part of the ocean, and you go to another part, and now you've got these species. Uh, in 1949, five cats were brought to, the Mar to Marion Island. It's only about 130 square miles. By 1977, there were 3,400. And this island is small, OK? And uh, it's right. Uh, I'm going to take a guess. It's either that dot or that dot. But it's down there. But the place is crawling with cats. And now the birds are in trouble. So that was not intentional. They were meant to be just happy little pets, right? Uh, brown tree snakes were accidentally brought to Guam. The snakes quickly multiplied, and they were responsible for the extinction of nine of the island's 11 forest dwelling bird species. That was not intended. I think they were brought there to help control rodents or something like that. And do you know why they were there? Accident that they flew in on an airplane. Oh, my. Well, there you go. Ranchers brought nutria, which are those rodents over here, from South America to North America to raise them for their fur. Well, that business never took off, so they just let the nutria go. And uh, now they're just totally taken over. There's, you see posters like this now. Um, be earth friendly, eco sustainable, eat nutria. There's just too many of them. There's just too many of them. And uh, big head and silver carp escape from fish farms and are now common in the Missouri River, North America. And other fish are starving because they are more aggressive when it comes to eating. So if a food supply starts to emerge, they will take it over. And, and, the, and the ones that are more slow on the uptake are not surviving. So, so there, these are some examples. Here's something else Star Trek. Uh, wisdom, the prime directive. We've all heard of that, right? The prime directive is a guiding principle of the United Federation of Planets, prohibiting explorers from interfering with the international development of alien civilizations. Using episodes where this directive is a major plot point, it seems to apply particularly to civilizations which are below a certain threshold of technological, scientific, and cultural development, basically forcing them to advance more quickly than they naturally would. 
Consequently, Starship crews are prevented from using their superior technology to impose their own values or ideals on them. But some of those episodes are wrapped around the idea that if I do it this way and I help them, I'm violating the prime directive. So can I stand by and do nothing? A lot of, I think there's only three episodes that have that going for them. I think it would be wise to give serious consideration to the consequence of interfering with the cultural development of Martian life, assuming it exists. I'm going to come down, I'll be just tell you right now, I'm coming down that let's not be too hasty, and I'll give you my, the, my strongest point a little bit later, too hasty about putting human boot prints all over Mars. Uh, I have a, there's something I want to bring up. Now, that's clearly against the prime directive. You see that? And uh, this one is very, very pointed. How do you act around people who don't like Star Trek? Well, you follow the prime directive and don't interfere with underdeveloped speech. <laughs> Just ignore them. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, how, that's how you do it. Um, uh, are you familiar with the NASA Houghton uh, Mars Project? Have you heard about this? This is a group. Uh, it's actually funded. It's a funded project where they're, they try to simulate what life would be like on Mars, and they just try to understand things. But they're doing it on Earth. So Dr. Pascal Lee, he's a planetary scientist, SETI. Uh, he's the director of, the, of this project. Uh, he uses his uh, analog Mars environment to investigate scientific questions concerning how humans might threaten life on other planets we colonize. This is kind of neat. People are thinking about this stuff. Uh, for example, if humans travel to Mars, would microbes transferred from our bodies thrive on Martian soil, threatening native Martian microbes and disrupting native ecosystems? Now, this is just, let's suppose, no one really knows uh, what's happened on Mars. Um, the experiment that I had the, the pleasure of being associated with, I was on radio science. I wasn't on the life experiment. I was doing radio science for the Viking, which meant we, we were doing experiments with the radio link uh, with the spacecraft. But you get to hang out. You have lunch. So you learn things. And, uh, and uh, the experiment was not <laughs> sensitive enough to detect anything. The same experiment done in the Atacama Desert didn't detect life. And we know there is. I mean, it's small. So it was a sensitivity issue, probably. Or maybe there is no life on Mars, but you don't know. Uh, when, you get a, when, you get, when you get a negative detection, uh, you're still kind of uh, undecided as to what the, the reasons are. Recent results from Lee's research suggest the answer to that is no, at least not on the surface of Mars soil. He argues that the harsh climate and the high UV radiation would kill off many of the microbes we may accidentally bring from Earth. So he's already saying, well, don't worry about it. The UV from the sun, because the, the primary source of UV absorption in, in our atmosphere are, uh, are, are those triatomic molecules that are just very efficient at absorbing. You know, ozone's an example. Um, they can absorb high energy photons. And then, of course, uh, it manifests, it, it, uh, the energy balance results in just a warmer temperature in the atmosphere. So it converts photon energy into thermal energy. And uh, that protects us, keeps us from having um, Skin cancer issues, you know, problems with our, you know, our retinas. Because uh, UV, the, uh, the energy of a UV photon can break uh, a molecular bond and totally change the chemistry, the biochemistry. So, so he's arguing Mars, probably not life there. Uh, along with other Mars analog study sites in Antarctica and the Atacama Desert in Chile, they bring light uh, numerous ethical questions of how we should behave as interplanetary colonists. This is something we need to think about before we have to do it, as opposed to something that we should kind of call an audible when we find the situation around us. As humans accelerate their space travel capacity and aim to colonize Mars in the next several decades, these questions are becoming less lofty and more immediately urgent. For example, if humans were to land on Mars and were somehow lethally threatened by Martians, and that could be like a virus. I mean, we've seen uh, War of the Worlds, right? I mean, you know, we know we know viruses can Anyway, that's how we took them out. Anyway, uh, maybe they want to get even. So um, anyway, well, how should, hum should humans attack? You know, this is the prime directive. And Lee says, yes, if at some point it, it came down to either me or the microbe on Mars, it's going to survive. I'm probably not going to hesitate, he says. But that's a quote. I thought you find that interesting. COSPAR, uh, I think a lot of you know about this. It was, uh, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty well known. It's, a, it's, a, it's an acronym. Stands for the Committee on Space Research. The International Council for Science, consisting of 142 countries, has organized COSPAR to help answer some of the tough questions about interplanetary travel. Um, but their, their study isn't complete. Um, uh, there's, there's something that's been omitted in what they've done. Um, 
the United Nations Outer Space Treaty in place since 1967. Do you guys remember this? You guys know about the Planetary Protection Office at NASA? People are always joking. They think, is this where you guys hide like the super weapons? And no, 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 that we're protecting planets from, uh, from humans uh, destroying it, not protecting planets from alien uh, warships and stormtroopers. Anyway, it's kind of funny. Anyway, but also help streamline some of the ethical and legal implications that this issue raises. The guidelines are strict on keeping spacecraft clean. That's something that's in the treaty. You're required to keep the spacecraft uh, clean. That's uh, Viking we sterilized. When looking for life on other planets, but less stringent for spacecraft traveling to a celestial body for other reasons. So what dictates how you treat your spacecraft is the, is the point. We just want to go and take pictures or something. Then suddenly the, 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 they relax the standards. Okay, but if you're looking for life, you've, you know, if you're going to stand there and you just want to like take pictures, they don't force you to. Uh, the treaty does not demand that you sterilize. Yeah. Also, the guidelines don't address the protection of the environments or ecosystems on those planets either. So, um, if you're doing something that would say change. Uh, Maybe change the way minerals, uh, uh, what minerals are present, or uh, if you introduce a bacterium that in, uh, invades uh, something that's under the soil and affects the, uh, the, 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 the uh, microorganisms that are already there. It doesn't talk about that. Uh, the contents of the treaty, this is a quote from Catherine Conley, who's the head of the Planetary Protection Office. Uh, the contents of the treaty are just guidelines. They are not laws, and the legal implications of not following them remain unclear says Catherine Connolly, head officer at NASA's Planetary Protection Office. Yeah, it's kind of like the private code. They're just more like guidelines, but not actually rules. Yeah, yeah I, I knew a lot of us would pick up on that almost. It's almost the exact same words, too, which is kind of wild. Uh, but now, as more private companies like SpaceX enter the field to visit Mars, the playing field has changed, OK? Um, once, OK, this is Jim Green. Uh, quote, once Astronauts arrive, it's game over. It's, it's then the clash of two potentially different ecosystems. And, uh, and uh, um, that, sort of, that sort of mimics my thoughts on the subject. I feel like there's some critical science that has not been done on Mars. Let's not ruin it, OK? And I'll, I'm going to talk about that in a second. OK, time for movie clips. Pass the popcorn. You guys ready for this? Uh, because uh, if, if this is just too much, maybe we can just like put our heads down and take naps. <laughs> Think you can handle this? All right. What I don't know is how loud it's going to be. Um, I thought I balanced the sound pretty good, uh, but uh, here we go. Stowaway species. Yeah, the movie Alien. Uh, technically, this is a horror film. But for those with small children, anything that would be disturbing has been blacked out. And so don't, don't, don't worry. It's going to be fine. And it's, yeah. It's got scary music. That doesn't help, right? Yeah. It's introducing species from another planet into the, uh, into the human race inadvertently. They were just awakened from their sleep when because the, the, they're traveling long distances.
Keep trying. Calling Antarctica Traffic Control. Do you read me, Antarctica? Over. This is the sound it. Your shortness may be too reticulate. Registration. Can you reach the outer room yet? Yeah. Two, four, six, eight, nine. Calling Antarctica Traffic Control. How long have you been out here? Over. Well, some of you may have figured out we're not home yet. Only halfway there. Mother's interrupted the course of my journey. Why? Yeah. She's programmed to do that should certain conditions arise. They have. Like what? Seems she has intercepted the transmission of unknown origin. She got us up to check it out. A transmission? Out here? Yeah. That's the spacecraft from uh, um, Prometheus. I don't know if you know that. In the movie Prometheus, that's the spacecraft from that. Yeah. Kind of scary music that has a scary sound.
second game. We'll take our chances in the shuttle. Blow up the shuttle. There you go. Anyway, that's kind of like with the muscles. They, they found, although in this case, the robot, who he did not know was a robot until towards the end, was the driving, he was the one that was keeping it going. Because common sense kept rising to the surface, and, uh, uh, and he would sort of say, no, 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 no. So anyway, there you go. Uh, <clears throat> the prime directive, I tried to find out when this was established. And uh, so you gotta, you gotta do some digging. Um, but probably between 2154 and 2265. And my reasons are these. Because in theory, Star Trek took place in the very first episode of the first series, in theory, was 2265. And Avatar, 2154, no prime directive. <laughs> no prime directive. Uh, and, uh, so interacting with ET life, and uh, whoops, sorry, that's not the way it's supposed to work. I'm supposed to click. They should have an agreement. All movies have to be the same volume level. Now this movie has something in common with aliens. You guys know what it is? Exactly, the Gorney Weaver. Me and Norma here to drive these remotely controlled bodies called avatars. And they're grown from human DNA mixed with the DNA of the natives. Hey, welcome. Welcome to Pandora. Good to have you. Damn, they got big. Yeah, they pulled the control on the flight out. So the progress up the sim seem to work really well. Yeah, they've got great muscles on them. It'll take us a few hours to get them decanted, but you guys can take them out tomorrow. There's yours. And the concept is that every driver is matched to his own avatar so that their nervous systems are in turn or something. Which is why they offer me the gig because I can link with Tommy's avatar, which is insanely expensive. Grace? Oh, this is Jake Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know who you are, and I don't need you. I need your brothers. You know, the PhD who trained for three years for this mission? He's dead. I know it's a big inconvenience for him. How much lab training have you had? I just had good problems. You see? You see? I mean, they're just pissing on us without even the courtesy of calling it rain. I'm going to self rich No, Grace, no I'm man, this is such idea. bullshit. You're going to kick his corporate butt. There's no business sticking his nose in my department. Here tomorrow, 0800. Try and use big words. <laughs> you know, I enjoy our little talks. Oops. I need a researcher, not some jarhead dropout. Well, actually, I thought we got lucky with him. Lucky? Yeah. How is this in any way lucky? Well, lucky your guy had a twin brother, and lucky that brother wasn't some moral hygienist or something. A Marine we can use. I'm assigning him to your team of security escorts. The last thing I need is another trigger-happy moron out there. Look, look, you're supposed to be winning the hearts and the minds of the natives. Isn't that the whole point of your little puppet show? You look like them, and you talk like them, and they'll start trusting us. This is why we're here. Unobtainium. 
because this little gray rock sells for 20 million a kilo. That's the only reason. It's what pays for the whole party. It's what pays for your science. And right now, now those savages are threatening our whole operation. We're on the brink of war, and you're supposed to be finding a diplomatic solution. So use what you've got and get me some results. I'll do with minimal casualties to the indigenous. I'll drive them out with gas first. It'll be humane. More or less. All right, let's pull the trigger. Dr. Augustine, you cannot be up here. Back off, Parker. Wait. Stop. These are people you're about to... No, 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 no. They're fly-bitten savages that live in a tree. All right, look around. I don't know about you, but I see a lot of trees. They can move. Can you guys just please? They're families. They're children. Babies. Are you going to kill children? I don't want that kind of blood on your hands. Believe me. Just let me try to talk them out. They trust me. Anyway, kind of single-minded, uh, no level of common sense, compassion, any kind of thought about the future, it's just, anyway. So uh, that's kind of my concern, that, got, that kind of more parallels what I'm worried could happen on Mars. Uh, so what's the big deal, okay? Let's get to the science. Okay, I'm going to give you a timeline, the oldest life on Earth, okay? Earth formed about 4.6 giga years ago. Okay, so here's our timeline. Okay, everything on this slide spans a billion years. Okay, and the numbers go backwards because we're talking about ago. All right, Earth formed about 4.6 giga years ago, and that's a picture of the solar nebula. I mean, an artist drawing. <laughs> uh, the moon formed when Thea, a Mars-sized object, collided with Earth about 4.4 to 4.45 a billion years ago. So I put that picture here. The Hadean uh, eons, uh, it comes from the word Hades, which means hellish. Okay, uh, the, the, the Hadean eon is a geologic eon that began, that begins with the formation of the Earth and ends uh, at about four, gig, four um, billion years ago, uh, during which Earth is believed to have been essentially molten. So from here to here, the Earth was molten. The late heavy bombardment is an event thought to have occurred approximately 4.1 to 3.8, the gray, lighter gray. Um, during this interval, a disproportionately large number of asteroids are theorized to have collided with the early terrestrial planets and the inner solar system, including Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And we see remnants in the cratering. Graphite, graphite found in Canada's Labrador region in three, uh, from 3.95 billion years ago showed the presence of organic material that was biogenic, uh, basically created by living beings, or organisms, that's what they thought, that's what they think. And uh, the first supercontinent, Balbara, appeared around 3.6. So uh, up until this point, you don't even have a crust on the planet that's stable, okay? They pop up, they disappear, they pop up, they disappear. Earth probably began as a water planet, and then uh, you got, to, as things calmed down. Okay, so. So what is something that science has discovered, something that science understands? We now know, I mean, we now, we've known for a while, that life appeared on Earth as soon as conditions would support life, and that life appeared, geologically speaking, very suddenly. As soon as liquid water 
uh, could linger on the surface of the earth. It's almost like that. Life just appeared. Life just appeared. So apparently, it can happen very suddenly. Uh, that would lead some people to conclude, well, then maybe life can actually form quite easily under very general conditions. So there should be life on other planets. So this is, this is a thought or a thread that uh, you get to read a lot about. Uh, we do have primordial soup issues. Um, we all know Stanley Miller. Uh, this is the experiment uh, he conducted in 1953. It's filled with water. It's got methane. It's got ammonia. It's got hydrogen uh, gas in it. There's a spark discharge chamber. And uh, his, goal, his goal was to try to simulate early Earth conditions and see if he can somehow create uh, biomolecules uh, in the, from very, very simple uh, from a very, very simple system like this. And we, sometimes we call that the Opaine Haldane, uh, Haldane hypothesis. And he was trying to test that. Um, the problem is that his experiment what did ha has been kind of criticized. Uh, for one, it was conducted almost 200 times. Uh, but the most successful run was the run in which humans actually twiddled the inputs because they, didn't, they weren't getting amino acids. So they said, we need to manipulate the system. And the problem is, the one where humans twiddled the system, that's the one that got published. That's the one that got published. And that, that was sort of regarded as not uh, a very good move. Um, in the best run, uh, of the 21 amino acids we normally associate with living systems, only, are, I mean, of the 20, uh, the two simplest are, are present in sufficient concentrations. So, uh, about 18, if they were there, were below a certain concentrations that uh, they were looking for, uh, which meant that the 18 more complex ones didn't really technically appear in, uh, in large concentrations. The trap was regarded as an intentional, or a way of maybe inadvertently producing selection effects. Uh, the trap basically turned this into an amino acid factory. It didn't allow amino acids to circulate and perhaps break down. Uh, both left and right hand molecules were present uh, in, the, in the residue, and uh, one of the things we know is that life chemistry, as we understand it on planet Earth, is uh, all the molecules that we see in, in amino acids are left-handed. Unless it's 100% left-handed, you can't produce amino acids. You cannot have a mixture of left and right and get amino acids, okay? So, like, proteins can't assemble unless all the chiral amino acids, uh, um, uh, uh, the bioactive uh, amino acids are chiral, either 100% left-handed or 100% right-handed. You can't have a mixture. The problem is this experiment produced a mixture. All the amino acids we see on meteorites, it's a mixture. And so what we don't know is how do you get only left-handed? Because if you don't have purely left-handed or purely right-handed, and by left-handed or right-handed, when you look at the, uh, the molecule itself, okay, you've got an amine group, you've got an acid group, and you've got this hydrogen just sort of hanging off on the end here. If, if the, uh, you can see how it's oriented. It's kind of like your hands. If that hydrogen represents the thumb, is the thumb on the right or the left? Uh, and so you have the two types. If you mix them, you can't produce amino acids. Uh, I mean, you can't produce proteins from those amino acids, excuse me. All organisms on Earth manifest only left-handed chiral amino acids. No known mechanism to explain why only left uh, molecules would end up in living systems. So there's a lot of mysteries about this experiment, and a lot of people feel that in some ways it's not really uh, a, a trustworthy test. Um, another problem is when life appeared on planet Earth, the gases in our atmosphere were carbon dioxide and nitrogen. So you didn't even have the right gases in it. So again, it's just sort of an interesting chemistry experiment now. It doesn't really have any bearing on when life did appear. Uh, Carl Sagan, he calculated, this is a calculation I found that he had done, uh, he calculated the primordial soup must be at a minimum the size of all the Earth's oceans and then a minimum of a billion years, not just a billion years, a billion years where the conditions in those oceans have to be at an optimal chemical level and an optimal, an opti optimally physically, that means temperature and so forth, for, for, uh, for a billion years, uh, needed for any self-assembly of a single cell organism to be possible. And the thing is, we all know life appeared in a geological instant. As soon as life could appear, it appeared that quickly. And, uh, and that's been a, that's sort of an issue. Uh, Earth's oceans must be packed with dense concentration of all the required building block molecules, and these molecules must be homochiral. Over the past seven decades, origin of life researchers have discovered that none of these requirements for an explanation of life's origin on Earth were met. And I'm going to show you um, 
the year, uh, there's a conference that's held every three years, and it's, it's uh, the attendees are the origin of life, the leading origin of life researchers in the world. Uh, in 1999, I had discovered through somebody else who uh, keeps up with this stuff better than I do, um, uh, this is something they presented at the meeting in, in 1999. Um, Earth's early atmosphere was oxidizing, not reducing. Radioactive isotopes in the presence of a hydrosphere yields oxygen gas. And here's the, here's the reaction. When you have, uh, you know, Earth's crust is filled with, uh, with radioactive isotopes. Water, which is a hydrosphere, water in the presence of that will eventually produce free oxygen. You cannot, you cannot assemble large chain molecules in an oxygen or an oxidizing environment. It can't be done. Uh, geologists studying the ancient zircons, and what you do here is you're looking at these crystals that uh, qualify as they're called zircons. Uh, you look at uh, isotope, uh, isotopic uh, uh, oxygen ratios, and they now know that at the time that these uh, at the time that these zircons formed, the Earth's atmosphere had tons of free oxygen in it. So we now know the Earth had an oxidizing atmosphere at the time that life emerged. So, and at this conference, they all pointed out oxygen makes it impossible. Not unlikely, it's impossible to assemble amino acids out of a primordial soup. Uh, there's something that's become known as the oxygen UV paradox. We had mentioned earlier uh, how we are protected from ultraviolet radiation. Oxygen makes it, makes it impossible to assemble amino acids out of a primordial soup, but oxygen is required to protect large chain molecules from UV radiation. So if you, you need oxygen to protect life, but you can't have oxygen to make it. And those have to happen at about the same time. So it's sort of a, a paradox that's yet unresolved. Scenarios where life molecules were transported to early Earth became popular in 1999. And now you're starting to see, and this came out in 99. So after this announcement was made, basically they were saying, we don't, we don't think the primordial soup scenario is accurate. So I said, well, that's OK. Life must have been brought here from elsewhere. And you start to see these types of, um, this actually made the cover of this magazine. I went back to the year where this announcement was made. And, uh, and again, it's the, cover, it's the cover article. And trust me, if that was just science fiction, it wouldn't make the cover of this magazine. This, is, this was cutting edge science at that time. Uh, the 18th International Conference, that would be the one that just happened this past summer. Uh, the climax of the conference, they had a special session. The climax of this conference was on Wednesday, July 19th. Is that day important to you? She was married on that day, 31 years ago. All right, uh, <laughs> to me. <laughs> anyway, but uh, uh, on that session, devoted to answering the question, this was the purpose of the special session. 64 years after the Miller experiment, can the formation of building blocks of life be considered as solved? These are the best in the business coming together, OK? Uh, the Miller experiment, as I mentioned, 1953, Stanley Miller sparked the gas uh, mixture and so forth. And we know that now that we look at it, you know, in hindsight, we can see the experiment didn't even simulate early Earth conditions, and it still had problems with homochorality and all those other problems. Um, a panel consisting of, of the world's top, for the world's top origin of life researchers, Nicholas Hudd, uh, Jack Sozak, I don't know these people, Stephen Banner, uh, Donna Blackmond, and moderated by Antonio uh, Lascano, which is interesting because that was Stanley Miller's research partner. And uh, he's the past president of the International Society for the Study of the Origin of Life. And they were all allowed to answer this question. 64 years after the Miller experiment, can the formation of building blocks of life be considered as a solved science question? All four, and the moderator said no to the post question. Stephen Benner even added that the building blocks of the building block molecules of life are either missing on the early Earth or they exist at abundance levels far too diluted to be of any use. So apparently, the operin haldane hypothesis is still hypothetical. How many of you knew that? I didn't know that. And so to me, this kind of caught my attention. I've been told this is a fact for I don't know how long. You're a chemist. You probably always knew. OK, so you win. You win. Uh, maybe we should party more frequently. And I'll, be, I'll probably be a lot smarter guy. Um, but nonetheless, I found this rather shocking. So what does that tell you? No one knows how life began on planet Earth. No one knows. So why are we going to trample on another potentially uh, um, a site that could, could harbor life? Why would you trample over it? 
That's another, you know, how, you know how in science we want repeatability? We want other, you know, let's try different conditions. So that becomes my concern at this point. Uh, so why preserving Mars surface is scientifically important? I understand that culturally going there could be important. Stephen Hawking's pleas are not falling on deaf ears. I get what he's saying. So this is one of those weird situations where I don't know what we're supposed to do. What's the right thing to do? But uh, I, I just found it interesting, and I thought I would share that with you, along with some scary movies. OK. <laughs> Although we know when life first appeared on Earth, that's established. We know when it appeared. We don't know yet how it happened. We just don't know. OK? And we still don't know if Mars is an example of an abiogenesis site. We still don't know. You know, this would be what we're looking for uh, as, as a slogan that, that has a multitude of uses, but it's been used in this context. We're looking for uh, second genesis. You know, if we're going to describe Earth as first genesis, is there a second genesis? Could a second genesis have occurred? Okay, well, people talk about Europa. People talk about Mars. You know, we know about these sites. But we do know that putting people on Mars is a very popular idea. A second data point would be awesomely valuable for scientifically improving origin of life scenarios. We should thoroughly study Mars surface before it becomes overwhelmed by Earth-based organisms. Uh, this is Elon Musk at a press conference in September of 2017. There he is, grid-looking guy. Quote, so far, we're, not, we're really not seeing any sign of surface life on Mars. There's really nothing on the surface of Mars. Well, he must, have missed, <laughs> he must have missed this picture taken by, uh, you know, um, the, the Phoenix spacecraft. There you go, or the Spirit. There you go. So, uh, so he must have missed something. Anyway, so there you go. Thank you for coming. <laughs> anyway. uh, all right. Well, I'm glad you're here. Um, it would be a good time. I can't believe it. I did it like in almost exactly an hour. I've never spoken for less than an hour. I don't think I ever have. The movie clips always go on and on and on. Another yeah. Miracle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But um, we don't have anything to do now outside because of the rain. Um, but I'll be happy to take questions uh, under the condition that they're easy. Okay, I don't throw any, I, don't, I only want softball questions, no hardball questions, but you have any questions about this or anything? Yeah. There's always the, the concern about the invasive species taking over the other one. You know, your, your species is going to take over the Martian one because they're incompatible. Our species, the microbes would be incompatible with theirs. Why wouldn't theirs overwhelm ours? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's just another thought. That's just another thought. Um, you're always thinking we're going to take over them, so maybe they would destroy our speed, our microbes. So in other words, instead of being, instead of being uh, cordial and kind about going over there, maybe we should be saying, we shouldn't go over there until we know that coming in contact with them is going to hurt us. Yeah, yeah. Um, we know stories like the cold virus being introduced and things like that um, in certain parts of the, of, the, of the planet, things like that. That's, uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. Thank you for that. Go ahead. I find that the attitude that we have is similar to the Europeans coming to America mm -hmm. and assuming that we are justified mm -hmm. in going to wherever we want to go. Mm -hmm. And whatever the native species are, it doesn't matter. Because mm -hmm. yeah. we're the important ones. Yeah. It's, just <coughs> it's a two-sided coin. Don't you find Elon Musk exciting? Like, woohoo! Okay, but at the same time, there's, there's, and, and that's what makes these types of decisions difficult, very, very difficult. And uh, as Pascal Lee said, he would, given a confrontation, he would make sure that his species won. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Yes, sir, go ahead. I've always wanted to um, find a, uh, another origin of life mm -hmm. to compare the two. Uh -huh. But if we, if with the pangenesis, it's, are we just finding our own relatives, say at Mars or something? What can we learn from that that's the same, yeah. same, if they are all left-handed, uh, have we found a, another species? We, don't, we still don't have a second genesis. No, no. Uh, we know of no other life. Now, you have to understand, um, many, many times in scientific history, 
people have said things, or they even said in athletics, you know, no one's going to break the four-minute mile, right? We, we kind of, we, we'll make these statements, but, but at this point in time, we're not aware of any uh, life organisms anywhere besides on planet Earth. I mean, they have found them on the, the windows of the space station. They found plankton on the outside surface of the, of the space station. It tells you that apparently it gets up there and it can make it. And if it can get to the space station, why can't the solar wind keep pushing it? Then the question becomes, would it survive the trip when it gets there? Uh, uh, so if we do detect life, it would make a lot of sense that you would do what, what we see on a lot of these CSI shows. You know, can you actually do a DNA analysis and look for similarities? Um, uh, if it is extremely similar, then maybe it did come from Earth. Uh, and, uh, but hopefully it's so different and radical. But to me, that's just an unanswered science question at this point. And I just don't want to trample, metaphorically, on the data uh, until we've uh, put our best people to the task. Yeah. yeah. Of course, the L form of amino acids is the dominant one. But when you get to carbohydrates, yeah, it's like the sugars, the it's the D form. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. still a, a thing. Why do we have one? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. right. Yeah. The, the, the five the five carbon sugars are all right-handed in living systems and things like DNA and RNA, things like that. You're exactly right. That's that's true. You, yeah. What would it take to to detect any kind of biologic on one of the exoplanets? Oh boy, that's another good question. Um, exoplanets at this point. Exoplanets at this point, what, what is, what is uh, cutting edge knowledge about exoplanets at this point, to the, to the best that I understand? I try to keep up with it, but you know, I'm always filling out forms, getting people evaluated, working on committees. So sometimes science takes a back seat. Science takes a back seat. Yeah. Um, let's see. We have techniques that allow us to, uh, that are very well established, that allow us to, do, to find indirect evidence of an exoplanet. Um, if an exoplanet is very massive, say Jupiter sized or larger, these techniques are very, very robust. Uh, the problems that we're discovering is that the easiest ones to detect aren't real good candidates if you're looking at the stable water cycle as, an in, as a good indicator, all right, that, that life could exist. Um, technology is now allowing us to measure smaller and smaller planets. Kepler is discovering all kinds. Uh, so we are moving in the right direction. Technology is improving. Um, uh, we haven't yet found an Earth-like planet around a Sun-like star yet. Uh, but you have to understand, Venus, if it were discovered 20 light years from here, would be classified as an Earth-like planet orbiting a Sun-like star. So, what we describe as a planet seems to be connected with uh, its size, uh, um, perhaps having an atmosphere. We're now being able to do some chemistry, I guess, by looking at starlight as it passes through atmospheres. Um, so if we follow that track, the only thing that makes sense to me is we would, we would do kind of like what, what Viking did on the surface of Mars. You're not detecting life, but you're looking at the byproducts of life and ruling out uh, chemical reactions as the source of whatever it is you're detecting, whatever molecules, and not necessarily uh, something that is biological. So, and, and, and to address your question, um, I'm not sure uh, that to talk about life on exoplanets, that technologically we're there yet. We are just starting to break, uh, uh, break through uh, to have the capacity to look for chemicals that could be associated with living systems. So again, we have indirect evidence of planets, now, we're, sometimes we even photograph planets, so that's direct evidence. And then we're getting indirect evidence of life. So we're still in sort of an indirect world. But things are going forward. Um, what would we look for? Uh, one of the other problems you encounter, and this is very, very philosophical, which means it's a subject I would enjoy discussing with somebody at length, particularly if I had a beverage in my hand, uh, you know, um, about uh, uh, what constitutes life and, um, you know, what are the problems about you know, have, have, have our, our way of interpreting what life is heavily biased by ourselves. You know, um, things like, um, you know, is carbon, carbon-based life really the only choice? My understanding is it's the best choice because it, um, because it, it, it forms um, uh, covalent bonds so well and it can bond with four neighbors. Uh, it, uh, um, 
things like, and it's very, very abundant. Carbon is an extremely abundant element in the cosmos. So it has uh, a lot going for it that uh, other, el uh, that other uh, elements don't have. So, but there you go. So just keep asking that question, Larry. Maybe I'll give you a straight answer the next time. <laughs> uh, yes, sir, please, go ahead. If purpose is going somewhere else, it's for a civilizational backup plan. Yes. And if everybody's all worried about stepping on a micro microorganism on Mars, why don't we go to the moon? Why don't we go to the moon? I mean, why don't we go to the moon? How does that yes. work from there? Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, I'm sure everybody heard the question, but I guess what he's basically asking is, is there a distinct advantage to Mars over the moon? Okay, is there a distinct advantage? And I'm not prepared to give you a detailed answer. I can only speculate at this point. One of the things I would think about is gravity. Um, Mars has twice the gravity that the moon does. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, as, as, uh, as humans, have to be prepared to deal with is uh, like bone demineralization seems like our, I'm sorry? That's the answer. Oh, you think so? Yeah. Well, gravity is a good thing. Without gravity, you, can, you can't walk. It's really hard. And uh, I do know our bodies respond well uh, uh, to use. So um, our, if you want strong bones, exercise. You know? um, I've always wanted a really, really good seat cushion back here. So I've chosen to get a job where I sit all the time. <laughs> And it, it's working yeah. perfectly. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, but that was a very good question, but gravity is the first thing that comes to mind. There is no magnetic field there, so there's no advantage there. Um, people used to talk about terraformation, but I think the economically, that doesn't make sense. Um, you're just, I think you're sort of responding to the question, could we do it? Well, yes, we could, but would we, could we afford it? Uh, because the, uh, it's not difficult on Mars for... Uh, uh, solar radiation to heat the surface of Mars to a level that any gas particles that come in contact with you have a, a dense atmosphere that's clinging to the surface, that some of those particles could uh, reach the escape speed for Mars' gravity and just sort of dissipate into space. Uh, it doesn't have much of a... So uh, I can't think of anything else. It does spin at a nice rate, so you'd have regular sunrises and sunsets. I think that's important for our biological clocks. I think when you put... I know of people who've been underground. There was some experiment. There was a woman... Uh, she went underground, and you know, we're just sort of testing. And it seems like our species and a lot of advanced species do really, really well with the periodicity of night and day. That seems to be a, a healthy thing for us. You'd have that on Mars. You would not have that on the moon. The moon, you'd get a sunrise and a sunset. Uh, uh, each one of those would occur once a month. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to go as fast as I can in my brain, and your hand is distracting me. Okay, I'm just going to change. I think the, they just did a study of a guy up in the... Space station that had been there for a long time. Yeah, some record. And they studied a difference between him and his brother. Somebody, brother. And his yes. Brother, and there were differences. And so the gravity thing is, part is of a big thing. Is He's also in a much more radiation intense environment. Yeah. He is. Um, what I understood about this article, and tell me if I am wrong, um, and I'm going to use the wrong words, so I'm not going to use the words. I'm going to use, I'm going to use descriptors. You can tell me what the word is I should have used instead of the sentence. But uh, when you look at bone demineralization or you look at maybe um, other aspects like uh, uh, blood pooling in your head as opposed to your feet, or actually probably pooling uniformly throughout your body, which would be a, uh, an increase in your head, instead of those kind of things, it actually was a microscopic level change. Is that true? So it was something in his, was it his DNA or something? Yeah. yeah. And that is interesting. That is extremely interesting. Um, but and, it, and it could have been more the effect of uh, higher doses of UV radiation than just the gravity itself. In space, I would probably put it more towards gamma ray, in all honesty. Yeah. Uh, it's got to get to the hull. Uh, and we do know the largest source of gamma rays that hit us all the time are from supernova remnants. And, um, and uh, so I, my guess is that's probably not UV, but uh, there is UV up there. Yeah. They may have UV lamps, you know. They want to get, uh, they, I mean... Doesn't, um, doesn't our body make vitamin D? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So answer this question. I read an article that says taking multivitamins is a waste of money. OK, OK, we have to vote. Okay. <laughs> I do it anyway. I know. Don't you feel better about yourself?
So maybe being in the sun is better in terms of vitamin D. Uh, so what if I drink milk? Isn't that like taking a vitamin pill, or is that different? Why is that different? Do you know? Well, the milk I'm fortifies vitamin D. So they started doing that because. Of but, uh, Pardon me? So there's an entire alphabet of vitamin D? Yeah. Oh, they're numbers. Okay, numbers. Okay. I was getting confused with the letters and all, you know? Yeah, my favorite vitamin, in case you're keeping notes, is vitamin J. I can't get enough of that stuff. It's called junk food. Vitamin J. Yeah. <laughs> Write that down. Yeah. Okay. All right. Speaking of that. <laughs> Speaking of, oh, okay. So maybe that's our exit. Uh, uh, let's go get some vitamin J, but I appreciate you guys coming. I will linger at the front. If you, have, uh, if you want to uh, ask a more a private question. But uh, I've enjoyed you coming. I can't tell you what it means to see this auditorium this full on a Friday, rainy Friday night that's cold. You guys are the best. Thanks for being here. <laughs>